a bit more still to come after this. So the plan is this, I'm going to summarize 50 odd years um, of being a religious educator in about three minutes. Um, share with you extracts of three real lessons and then reflect maybe a, a handful of reflections about what I've learned in those 50 years. Okay, can you all hear? Yeah. If, if my voice drops, can you just do that or wait? That would be really helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> I went into teaching in Catholic secondary schools as an RE teacher in 1971. And I taught between then and uh, 1983. I still carried on doing RE for a long time after that, but I became a deputy head and then a head and the chief inspector of a London borough. Um, so I've worked in secondary schools, um, universities since 1994, in a local authority as a chief officer, and in recent years, very much for the church. A lot of my work since 1995 has been in service work for teachers, primary, secondary, university, chaplains. And also, another aspect is conferences, when I've been working in Ireland for different groups in Scotland and England, of course, and Wales but also in America, Australia, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, and online. The writing that I've done, tonight, tonight is a, a book launch, the writing I've done since, 20, since 2000 has been also a form of religious education, mostly for teachers in Catholic schools. Um, and, um, it would be important to mention the family. Um, I've been married, this is our 52nd year of being married. Um, so the role of being a parent, my eldest child is 50, and his eldest child is 25. And that's enough, being a parent and a grandparent is another context for being a religious educator. <clears throat> so that's 50 odd years in three years. Um, I'm gonna give you extracts of three real lessons only a little bit of a lesson that I've either seen or I've been part of. You know when you go on teaching practice, you have to visit the school in advance to meet the teachers whose class you're going to take and to agree the scheme of work. That's still true, isn't it? So you go there before you're going to start, you, you, you have a sight of the class without teaching them, you probably watch the teacher at least once, and um, you agree what you're going to do. So at the age of 21, just before my long teaching practice in a, a boys' school, 11 to 18, 1800 boys, I visit this class of 15 year olds and I sit on the side so that I can see the teacher at the front and the pupils. It wasn't in a room like this, it was ordinary classroom desks, tables. And the teacher is a priest and he's writing on the blackboard. His back is turned to the class. And in the back row, one boy turns to the next boy and hits him under the chin and knocks him unconscious. And the boy very slowly slides to the floor and he's underneath the desk, unconscious. You can imagine what I felt like. I'm sitting there thinking, next week I have to teach this class in a month for, for, for 13 weeks. The lessons lasted 40 minutes. At the end of the 40 minutes, this boy that was unconscious had not become conscious. And the boy on each side picked him up by the elbows and carried him out the door. Somehow the priest never noticed. That was a real shock to me because it taught me that lesson preparation is urgent uh, 
and you need to give real careful thought, how am I going to cope? The next of the three lessons is a reflection by a past student who had it. I met this young man when he was 35 in somebody's house, a former colleague's house. And he said, you used to teach me. And I had to confess, I couldn't remember. When you teach thousands of pupils over as many years, you can't remember them all. And I said, and he said, you changed my attitude enormously. How come? I said. He said, well, to be honest, I hated religion and I hated you. This, when I was 15, that's when you taught me. I hated you and I hated religion. And then you did something that changed all of that. I said, well, what was it? He said, well, as usual, I wasn't paying any attention to you. And in fact, you were droning on the front, like I am now. And I was drawing a very dirty picture of you to insult you, you know, just doodling on my, my piece of paper. And he said, of course, you noticed, you always noticed what we were doing. And without stopping, carrying on the class, you walked up down the aisle to where I was. I can't do this because I'm told I've got to stay still. Okay, so I will do it and it'll go off camera for me. So I walked up to this boy and, and so he'd drawn this dirty picture and I'd been teaching him and then just when I dropped it the boy, I leant over, I hope you can hear this, I said, I wouldn't do it like that, I'd do it like this. Did you hear that? So you're supposed to laugh. Thank you. And then I carried on. So I said, well, why did that make a difference? He said, that was the moment when I saw you as a human being. That was the moment I started to take notice. I actually got quite interested in religion like that. It changed. So I asked him to unpack it. What was it about that? He said, number one, you noticed. Okay. Number two, you didn't ignore it. It would have been dead easy to pretend you didn't see it and do or or not want to do anything because you were frightened of creating a scene. Number three, you didn't call me out and embarrass me or humiliate me like you could have done. Uh, number four, you should it for you showed a sense of humor. And number five, you weren't that self-important. He said, that was a, no, I put it to you from that little extract of a lesson that I forgot. It is those little things, those encounters, which can change a person's attitude for better or for worse. The third, the third, so I'll call, the, the first one was the punch. The second one was the dirty picture. The third one is, I'll call it the mission. Uh, one week in teaching six form already, so they're, they're 16, they're 17, some of them are even 18. Instead of them being in four groups, we put uh, all the six form together. So that I don't know whether there's 120, maybe something like 120. And there's four RA teachers. I, I was the head of the department. I was the only one that was married. So there was me. Was a fairly youngish married man. Um, there was a religious sister, there was an unmarried woman, and there was an unmarried man. And I put the six formers before they all came together like this. I put them in very small groups and asked them to put on a piece of paper a question or a comment they wanted to make about the area of sexuality and sex education. Because I didn't want us to be lecturing them about what we thought they should or shouldn't know. I wanted the agenda to be one that mattered to them. And they were to put these pieces of paper into a basket. Um, and the baskets were then empty into one basket. And one sixth former was going to chair a panel. 
and it would be him who would pick out the basket and throw the questions at us. Uh, so they knew not only had they raised the questions, but we didn't know what they were going to be or who was going to have to answer them. Um, and he, he picked, there were several, quite a lot of questions. And one of them was, what is the church's position on positions? Do you get the question? My immediate quip was, we can't all be missionaries. Thank you. But what was beautiful, and the point, the point of this story is what happened next. So there's four teachers, and in the middle is a sixth form of his chairperson. What was lovely is that the, the, the young woman, beautifully naive, turned round to me as her head of department. I wasn't that old. I mean, we had three kids under, under five before I was 25. I only had to look at my wife and she got pregnant. We had, we had another one later. When, when, when I told, when I told, when I called the three together to say 12 years later, you know, we're expecting another baby. By then, the oldest was 14, going on 15. He thought it was gross. He was disgusted. The other two younger ones, the 10 and the 11 year old, thought it was exciting. But the 14 or 15 year old, on being told that we were going to have another baby, he just looked at my wife and I and just thought, that's disgusting. <laughs> that's gross. Because children, young people of that age can often fit old people past them by the time they're 30. Anyway, I've forgotten why I know that. So this young lady says to me, what is the question? The question, what was the question? Tell me what the question was again. What was the question this sixth form I had read out to us? Say it now. What is the church's position on positions? She leant forward, she said, what does that mean? What do they mean, positions? Very, but what was beautiful was that, number one, she had a relationship with me. I don't mean a sexual relationship, but she trusted me. Number two, she was willing to be vulnerable and honest. And they heard this. They saw this person, you know, uh, asking me this question. And they remembered. I don't want to make a big thing of this, but this a bit because you're realistic enough, and I'm sure you're honest enough to realize that some of the questions that are posed to teachers, especially by teenagers, are deliberately asked to embarrass you. And your task as a teacher is to not be embarrassed, but to give it a straight answer if you can and as honest as you can because they can tell when you're being real but apparently after the lesson was over they continued talking about this experience of exposing the teachers to unforeseen questions on this area of life for at least another hour together in their free time so it obviously made an impression so i said that so you have 50 plus years in three minutes then you have three lessons. So a handful of reflections on what I've learned in that 50 odd years. And the first reflection, I'm going to put it to you, there are four P's that every teacher of every subject, of every age level, in every context has to be aware of. And the four P's are, first of all, the philosophical. Can you still hear at the back? No? Hello? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. By the philosophical P, I mean the teacher has to know what are the key concepts, the content of what they're teaching. Do they know their way around the topics? Have they understood them themselves? If not, they can't explain them properly to others. So there is an intellectual or head sign to teaching. You do expect the teacher to be a bit of an authority on what they're teaching. The second P is political. I don't mean party political. I mean the fact that teaching involves the exercise of authority and influence. 
the teacher has to be aware of what are the ground rules that frame their work. What are the expectations of society, the head, the inspectors, the government, the parents? What are the expectations? What is their mandate? What are they authorised to do? If you are not sufficiently clued up about the rules that frame your work, you're likely to get a sack or get into trouble. The third P that applies to all teachers is the practical. Every teacher has to ask herself or himself, what do I need to bring to this class? What should I get them to do? What tasks should I set them? Reading, writing, acting, drawing, thinking, being quiet, in groups. How do I keep them to time? How do I manage the group if some of them step out of line? How do I keep their attention and interest? I have a confession to make here. When I first went into teaching, I used bribery. I don't need none. Uh, I used to take in my guitar, I play in a rock band still, actually, uh, every week for two hours. Um, I'm the youngest, we're all well over 70. I'm the youngest at 73, the others are several years older than me, so we call the elders. Have you heard of the Everly Brothers? No, ancient history, okay. I used to put my guitar against the wall, and I used to say, if you can work for 35 minutes out of 40, I'll play you some rock and roll at the end. And I thought that was pretty good, actually. If I got 35 minutes out of 40 from this class, these classes, I was doing pretty well. And they very quickly learned, if they didn't work for 35 minutes, I wouldn't play them any music. So the practical, how do we keep their attention and interest? And there's a fourth P to come, and this is the person. And there are two aspects to the person. The first is the teacher has to be aware of how she or he is coming across in the, in the minds of the pupils or students. How is what I am like as a person influencing my engagement with the students for better and for worse? Am I getting in the way of their learning sometimes? Adults, teachers sometimes do. And sometimes the best thing we can do is to get out of their way. So I'm putting it to you in the first part of the personal, that self-knowledge is an absolutely vital ingredient in a, in a teacher <coughs> that is going to help their pupils. A teacher without self-knowledge is almost definitely going to damage him or herself and their pupils. The second aspect of the personal it's not only how is what I like affecting how they're receiving this and responding, but what is this job doing to me? Is it reinforcing bad side of me? Is it distorting my personality? Is it making me depressed or suffering burnout? No pupil benefits from a teacher who is suffering burnout or depression. And is it ruining my family? So I'm putting it to that those four, the philosophical, political, practical, and personal, are necessary ingredients for teachers. <coughs> Second reflection, very, very short. I put it to you that religious education as a particular area of the curriculum should avoid being two things that it sometimes slips into being. The first is tourism. You know, a tourist, a tourist visits a country as a foreigner. They pick and choose what to see. They don't stay very long. They probably don't get to know that country very well. They don't know what it's like to be an insider, to belong to that country. They don't enter into the mindset of what it is to be in that country. And they move on. That's, that's teaching as tourism. Some forms of religious teaching are just that. They're, in other words, they're shallow. 
you wouldn't know at the end of that kind of teaching why it is that hundreds and indeed millions of people in the world either live by or kill for their religion. So religion, religious teaching as tourism sells pupils short. The opposite fault is teaching any teaching, including teaching religion, that is kidnapping. By kidnapping, I mean when your teaching captures, <coughs> imprisons, traps them, robs them of their freedom, puts them in a box. And the truth is some forms of religious teaching in the past and probably today still does that. It kidnaps or it tries to kidnap people. So there are two things to avoid. Third, there's only going to be a handful of reflections. The third reflection is about the connection between religious traditions and asking questions. I put it to you that religious traditions are a complex mixture of, on the one hand, discipline and devotion, which bring about a degree of commonality and bind people together who share that religion. They are disciplined, they do include discipline and devotion, but they nearly always include diversity and disagreement as well. And that element of diversity and disagreement, that is, we don't interpret members of that religion don't interpret it all the same way and argue about it, challenges the tradition and stops it from being unduly narrow, restrictive and exclusive. Religious traditions are a combination of conviction and question, of repetition and renewal, of stability and disturbance. <coughs> they always participate in a wider culture than just the religion and they meet resistance from that culture, and they offer resistance to that culture. Now, some people worry about asking questions of religions. Uh, I have to tell you that when I was young, my father would not allow us to ask any questions in case they got out of hand. Loads of topics were taboo. We were, we were, not, we were forbidden to ask all kinds of things. It was as if asking a question was basically saying you're on tape. Now I know I, I remember promising myself that if ever I became a parent, I would try my very best to be the opposite of that. Well, no parent succeeds completely, but I know that my own father, if he were alive, um, would be truly shocked at the things that get discussed around dinner time with my now grown up, but even when the children when they were little and teenagers, and with my grandchildren. Because I've always taken with you, my job as a parent and a grandparent is to keep the conversation going. The relationship is always more important than, than getting the result that I prefer to have. Some people then worry that raising questions about a faith does it show a lack of faith? If you do it in front of others, does it undermine their faith? Will it damage my relationship with people if I ask critical questions? Will asking questions open up a can of worms that we're best left untouched? And my response to that is this. If you're going to face the questions that will inevitably arise about any religious tradition, two human qualities are necessary. You need a, com a combination of confidence and humility. And I just want to unpack those two words. You need confidence in the tradition, confidence in the witnesses to that tradition, confidence in those who have given their lives to that tradition, confidence in God as the source of that tradition, but also in the human capacity to ask questions, which from a believer's point of view, that capacity to ask questions 
is itself God-given, and confidence that God is at work in your own life. But confidence on its own is not enough, because confidence can slip into arrogance or complacency. So confidence has to be tempered or qualified by humility. Humility about my inability to see the whole picture. Humility about my limitations and shortcomings. I don't even live up to my own beliefs all the time. Humility also to accept that despite my weaknesses, God wants me to take the risk of playing my part in God's world. Two, um, three more reflections. I put it to you that RE teachers and other teachers, but perhaps especially RE teachers, act as mediators of mystery or if you prefer, as bridge builders towards mystery. What do I mean by that? Let me put it like this. Reality confronts us. Reality intrigues us. It prompts us to ask questions, to seek answers and find meaning in life's experiences. Bad experiences, good experiences, all kinds of experiences. I put it to you that mystery knocks on our door, regardless of our circumstances or our commitments, and even whether or not we're actually searching for any meaning at that moment. Such mystery has its own timetable that's different from ours. It interrupts our usual pattern of thinking, of values, of responses, of expectations. <coughs> I think that teachers, especially teachers of religion, mediate between reality, mystery, and meaning for their pupils. And if there's any truth in that, if we are to be mediators of mystery, then we must be alert to and immersed in reality, because if we're out of touch with reality, we won't be able to help them. But we need to be receptive to mystery ourselves and to the surprises that life, life throws at us. And we need to be actively engaged in our own always unfinished search for meaning. Two final reflections. All teachers can contribute to pupils' spiritual development, but there is an expectation that the religious education teacher will pay a, play a special part in fostering spiritual development. It shouldn't all be out of it. Other people have a part to play, but certainly they do have a part to play. So what are the qualities that I think should be present in a teacher who has a chance of promoting the spiritual growth and development of the people they teach. Here are six suggestions. You might think of some more. The first is the teacher has to be the kind of person who is able to ask big, mind-boggling questions about life, and preferably questions that they do not know fully the answers to themselves. There's something artificial about asking pupils questions when they know that you know the answer. They're not the best questions. The best questions are ones in which the teacher herself or himself also is not sure. The second quality of a teacher needs, apart from being able to ask good questions, and I think the teacher's prayer should always be, dear God, teach me to ask good questions. But the second quality is, they need to be aware of some of the answers that some other people have tried to give to those big questions of life. Thirdly, they need to be aware that those answers that some people give do not satisfy everyone. They have limitations and shortcomings. 
there are no fully satisfactory answers to life's biggest questions. There are partial answers, but in this life, not perfect answers. The fourth uh, quality is the teacher needs to model, model being a person who has an open mind, um, ready to live with ambiguity and uncertainty. The fifth quality is, despite having said they have to have an open mind, they need to model being a person with an open mind. They also have to have a certain stability and settledness of their own convictions. A teacher who is deeply uncertain, who has no foundation, will in fact be anxious and defensive in front of difficult questions. They will have a position that will be untenable. So you do need a certain level of maturity and stability and some steady convictions to be of use, to be stable and confident enough not to be defensive and prickly. And the final quality I'll mention here is the teacher who wishes to sponsor, to help pupils to grow spiritually. They need a space making, I'll call it a space making ability. That means they can facilitate others' reflection about what life throws at them. The teacher needs to know when to be quiet and to foster silence and reflection. So often, so often teachers, for the very good reason that they're worried the class will get out of control, ask a question, wait three seconds and jump in, afraid of the gap. But if you wish to foster spiritual, spiritual, spiritual development for anyone, never happens in a rush. Or if people feel driven. You cannot force anyone to grow spiritually, and you can't rush it. So you need to be a person who can foster spaces for quiet, for sharing, for reflection. Well, that's something quite different from imparting information. So what that means, if I could say that, that all of that point in slightly different words, and then I'll come to my final reflection. That means that teachers need to be invitational in style and tone, rather than seeking to impose a ready-made answer on their pupils. They need to be relaxed about facing questions from students. They need to be people who can ask good questions themselves. They need a certain level of stability and maturity in their own outlook on life. You can only be hospitable in the classroom and make others welcome if you yourself are a home. Someone who feels very uncertain of their friends can't be hospitable to others. The teacher who is best placed to promote spiritual development and healthy reflection on spiritual and religious matters is one who has a healthy relationship <coughs> with what they're teaching as well as with who they're teaching. And my final reflection, you'll be glad to know, is coming up now. Just want to say a few words about teachers' personhood or presence. What are the factors that contribute to whether or not a teacher can truly be present to his or her pupils and therefore a present for them. I'm sure you've been in a room with people sometimes and although physically they're in front of you, you can tell that psychologically they're someone else. They're either in the dream world or they're worried or they're hostile, but they're not really present, they're not paying attention. If you're going to be truly present as a real person to your pupils, so that you can be a present form, there are a number of factors. I'm going to mention 
nine. Some of these are outside of your control, but some of them are not outside of your control. The first one is out of your control, but it is, it is operative. It's what is your mandate? I, I'm ending up like I did down with the four things. Every teacher is in a position with some mandate or authorization. Someone has said, it's okay for you to be here. This is your job. You're accountable for what you do. You have to answer to someone, not just the pupils. Well, that's outside your control. And there will be some circumstances where you're not allowed to be your real self, and that's not your fault. The second factor I also think is outside your control, but it is a big factor. How mature is the teacher? Maturity is not something you can decide to have or to be. It's, some, it's the fruit of life's experience and what you do with it. You can't will yourself to be mature. You can't decide to be mature. It's something that happens to you or not. The third, the third factor, though, is down to you. It is the teacher's sense of themselves in relation to the role. That is, do they understand what the role of being a teacher in a primary school or a secondary school or a university or a church setting or in a voluntary setting? Do they understand the role and how they fit into it? Do they accept the role and are they confident in the role? The fourth factor is also down to you and the students. What is the teacher's relationship with the students? How well do they know them? Now, if I relate that to this afternoon, that's a huge limitation how you can get out of me and how I can respond to you is I've never met you before, I've not had that pleasure. We probably might not meet again, so you don't have a chance to get to know me, and I don't have a chance to get to know you. So that in that it's out of our control. But when you do meet a class on a regular basis, if you're to, to do them any good, you have to get to know them and develop a, a constructive relationship. Um, I think that was number four. So how many more are left? Let me see who's paying attention. Come on. How many factors did I say I was going to say? Nine. Well done. Thank you. So this is number five, I think. And this is down to you again. How honest and vulnerable is the teacher willing to be? I'm not suggesting when I say that you should tell all the pupils all about your private life. The teacher is entitled to a private life, just as the pupil is entitled to a private life. But I put it to you for your reflection that the teacher who shares nothing of his or her real self, who hides their real self, will almost definitely not get very far in making a positive difference to their pupils. But of course, it's up to you how honest you're prepared to be and how vulnerable you're prepared to be, what risks you're prepared to take. The teacher who takes no risks in disclosing their real self <coughs> is probably a very sad teacher and their pupils too. That was five. Number six. Another factor in whether the teacher's personhood is truly brought into play is their self-knowledge or self-awareness. Can they reflect on how they're coming across as a person, how they're being received, how the job is affecting them? I mentioned this at the beginning. Number seven. The teacher needs to have a strong sense that this game of teaching is worth playing. I predict that if you do become a teacher, you will have bad lessons, you will have bad days, you might even be unlucky to have a bad week. There will be setbacks, frustrations, disappointments. But if you have a strong sense that 
Despite those, this game is worth playing. Teachers can make a healthy and positive difference to the lives of their pupils. You won't cave in when you have a bad lesson uh, or a bad week. <coughs> and that sense that the game is worth playing is nothing to do with being rewarded, approved of, promoted, getting a reputation, being paid well. It's thinking this activity is worth doing. That's called intrinsic motivation, not extrinsic. Two more. The next factor is how well does the teacher integrate three dimensions of being a person? One is the intellectual. The second is the practical or professional. And the third is the spiritual. Now, if you were to ask me how long does it take a normal person to learn how to integrate the intellectual, the practical, and the spiritual, I would say about 85 years. And I'm only 73. So that means I haven't got there yet. I'm still learning. It takes a lifetime to integrate one's character and personality in all its dimensions. But we can make efforts, we can make progress. And the more integrated you are as a person, rather than these being separate compartments, the more likely it is you will be present in the right way for your pupils. And the, the, the final, the ninth factor for me is the primacy of being overdue or of the inner life over performance. Performance doesn't matter, competence doesn't matter, but what matters more is the quality of the person, of the teacher, and how that teacher touches the life and brings life to their students. To the extent that you can be like that, that although performance and outcomes and, uh, and achievements you want to give up to pupils, but if it's always more important that a person engages with another person and gives them some kind of new life, that will enable them to be present to themselves and to others and to God and to, 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 to people who matter to them. So in conclusion, my calling as a teacher, I think, is to awaken and nurture something that is present and potential already there in, in, in potency, possibility, in the learning. I can only do that awakening and nurturing if I am present to them through the way I relate to reality, to religion and to them. Where their road takes them, after I've done my bit, after I've done my awakening and nurturing role, that's not up to me, it's up to them, and that great mystery which holds, sustains, invites, and transforms both them and me. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't have very long, so forgive me. I'm going to put you a question for you to think about. I've tried to be both realistic and idealistic. Uh, when, I, when I began teaching almost you know, 50 odd years ago, Mr. White, a housemaster, that I, whose house I was put in when I went on teaching practice. Mr. White met me on my first day in the school and he said, you want to forget all that idealistic crap they taught you in college. You get the buggers first or otherwise they'll get you. Mr. White hated the pupils. He, he hated teaching. He was desperate to retire and he was still in his late 50s so he had a few years to go. 
And I thought, dear God, please never let me get like this to write. Make me leave teaching if ever I get that sort of one. Because you can be sure that if a teacher hates teaching, the pupils will hate it. Um, so I'm not ashamed of being an idealist or realist. And my question is this. The realist side of me says to me, nearly everything I've said this afternoon will be forgotten. But I want you to imagine it's six months' time. Let's say it's next May. And you come across a student who is absent this afternoon. And for some reason, they say to you, were you there that afternoon when that strange visitor, Sullivan, came? Because I missed that afternoon. Is, is there one thing you hope you will remember from this afternoon that you could tell that imaginary student? And so you heard a lot. Is there, is there anything you heard this afternoon from me that you hope you will hold on to? It might not be new. You might have known it already. It doesn't matter. But is there one thing that you've heard this afternoon that you hope you will hold on to next month?